Hi, we're Gloria and Emilio Stefan, and we are alive on South, South Beach. Beach. Yes, they are. Yeah, baby. Hi, I'm Dina Stewart. And I'm Stuart Stewart. And we're alive on South Beach. A show with a little bit of this and a little bit of that. You know, the social season is really winding down to its finish, and this year we met such a great group of very interesting and somewhat quirky people. Miami, and especially South Beach, has become like the f little niche for all kinds of film festivals. Mm -hmm. We There was the Brazilian Film Festival, of course, the, the big international film festival, there's a Sicilian festival, there's an Italian festival, there's a Spanish festival, there's a Jewish festival. The last festival we went to was... NIFO, that's Miami Fort Lauderdale LGBT Film Festival. What I like about the film festivals is you get an opportunity to talk yeah. to the directors. And the directors are really like the, the people that give birth to this film because they put it all together. And they have such great passion about what they do that I, I just love hanging out with them. Tell me a little bit about the film. What's the name? The film's called Two Secrets. It's a, first of all, it's a true story about a girl from here in Miami. Um, and it uh, goes like this. Two secrets will change a 12-year-old girl's life forever. One, she's never told a soul. The other, her entire family's never told her. Tonight, they crash. This is Ali Dolan. And this is Charles Dye. Nice. And the movie w that I saw was called Two Secrets. Yes, Two Secrets. How come there's only Two Secrets? Originally, we were going to call it Secrets. And uh, not that the secrets were going to change, but we were going to call it Secrets. And we uh, realized people are going to know what the first secret is. People aren't even going to know that there is a second secret. And we thought that changing the title to Two Secrets would add this specificity of people going, okay, so I know what the first secret is. As they get into the film, the first secret is revealed sort of early. Um, what is the second secret? So that was kind of one of the reasons why we went with the title, Two Secrets. Why do you think that your story is, is, is enough to make a film and really have a message to it? And what is the message? Two Secrets is sort of a prelude to a much, much larger story also why we were going to call it secrets because there's many more things along the way. Um, when I was growing up I knew that I was adopted which was a really cool thing. Mm -hmm. I felt really special, I felt wanted, selected and uh, I, there was a lot surrounding that, however, that made me feel like maybe there was something more to that story that my parents weren't telling me about. I also had um, some secrets about my life, some things <laughs> personal uh, about my orientation. Uh, I knew from a very, very early age that I was attracted to girls and not to boys. And I grew up in rural Pennsylvania. It was, you know, the 90s. It was not something that you talked about back mm -hmm. then as freely and openly, openly as you do today. So I uh, was harboring that secret uh, for uh, 10 years of my life, really. And uh, that's one of the secrets that we delve into. So what's the second secret? Uh, the second secret will be revealed uh, at the end of the film. Well, then I'm going to have to see the movie. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. This is Casper Andreas. And he is one of the filmmakers who is showing two films in this film festival? I think I'm the only one with two films in the festival, yeah. <laughs> Tell us the names of the two films. Uh, tomorrow night, my film Flatbush Luck is screening. And then on Sunday, Kiss Me, Kill Me. Well, give me the elevator pitch for each one. Uh, well, Flatbush Luck, is, uh, it's kind of like a mixture of genres. So it's, um, it's like, I call it a romantic dramedy cr crime caper. And Kiss Me, Kill Me is a West Hollywood murder mystery. What's in the future for Casper? Are you making another film? Well, uh, I have two films at this festival. <laughs> I think I need a break. I have <laughs> but I actually have a couple of films, I'm, projects I'm working on. I'm helping my friend Madeline produce her new feature. It's a, it's a lesbian love story uh, about um, Emily Dickinson called Wild Nights with Emily, starring Molly Shannon. 
And I'm also, I have two projects in the works that I'm directing that uh, may or may, you know, hopefully will happen this year. At least one of them, hopefully, I pray, will happen this year. It's bigger budgets, so who knows. It's One is a, more like a total comedy, and the other one is a dramedy, I guess. Well, you have a passion for what you do. When people have a passion and really love what they're doing, they're going to succeed. So congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. I bumped into this lady. Her name is Robin Simon, and we met many years ago. But now I'm meeting you again, and you're a filmmaker. And tell us a little bit about your film. Well, the name of the film is Uncle Gloria, One Hell of a Ride. It's a macho auto wrecker from South Florida who hides from the law as a woman and begins a wacky, bizarre journey of self-discovery. And what does she discover? I think that she likes to be a woman. Uh, sounds like a plan. A sex change operation and finds a bizarre gender-bending relationship, all while trying to heal a very dysfunctional family. It's dark and funny. With all the renewed interest in Cuba because of our renewed relations, everybody can't wait to go to Cuba. But they're going to go to the Cuba of Today. the revolution and the mm -hmm. Castros. There was a Cuba before that, mm -hmm. and it was so culturally rich. We're at an exhibit at the Wolfsonian here on Miami Beach, which I never imagined would take place when I first came down here. But now that Cuba and America have closer relations, everybody is curious and wants to know more and more about Cuba. They read about it maybe in some of the foreign newspapers, but these are pictures and posters of what Cuba was like before the revolution. This is Francis Xavier Luca, but he likes to be called Frank, so hello Frank. Hi, how are you tonight? Tell him, why are we all here? Well, we're here because we have an amazing collection that was just donated to the Wolfsonian looking at the U.S.-Cuba relationship and what perfect timing. Uh, it's amazing because I saw some pictures up there and I'm all excited. I want to go to Havana now and see what it's like. I do as well. I'm standing with Herb Sosa, a local art critic who attends every art exhibit that I've ever been to. <laughs> so what do you think of this one? I think this one's great, and yes, we have both been to many, many exhibits. Uh, it's wonderful to celebrate the culture and the richness that is Cuba and our culture and our heritage, and I'm thrilled that the Wolfsonian FIU uh, is showcasing it in such a beautiful way. A lot of people don't uh, really realize, uh, again, how rich the Cuban culture is. They really just know from 1959 forward, and there's so much to offer, and this exhibit, I think, shows that. Well, when we came down here, you just opened up a little store in Española Way that was all Cuban culture. And I remember we used to talk a lot, and you, you taught me a lot about Cuba that I just didn't have any idea. You, when they write the history of South Beach, you were the pioneer that brought Cuban right. culture to all of us Anglos who didn't have a clue. So thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm flattered and honored, A, that you remember, and <laughs> B, that you said that. Uh, it, it's my culture. It's my heritage. And Babalu, which was the name of the store in Española Way, was my way of bringing together everything I loved, which was my, uh, I, I was a retail designer, worked for Burdines for many years as the creative director, and then bringing that together with my culture, with my heritage, was a dream come true for me. And that's what Babalu, the, the, the shop, was all about. So again, to see something like this in a, in a museum uh, just gives me goosebumps. One of the best events for me is the Miami Book Fair International, mm -hmm. because hundreds of authors from around the world descend on Miami to present their book to audiences and to meet the press that comes down specifically to meet them. This is Ada Calhoun, who's a journalist, a mm -hmm. um, theater critic, been, yeah. and a whole bunch of other things. And she's also an author, and you wrote a book called St. Mark's is Dead. Now I have a question for you. When did it die? 
the title's kind of a joke because the idea is the street's always been for young people and as soon as they stop being young, they say, well, it's dead now. But of course, every generation has said that for hundreds of years. The street has been important to generation after generation of young people and there is a huge part, you'll be happy to know, about the 1960s. Tons about the Fillmore East and the Electric Circus and the Dom. Um, yeah, I figured you'd... <laughs> and, um, so it's, it, but it also was really important for punk, obviously. Manic Panic was there, Trash and Vaudeville, CBGB's was really close by, New York Dolls, Ramones hung out there. And, but also, you know, Emma Goldman was there in, the, in 1906 and, um, and Leon Trotsky was there and uh, W.H. Auden, the poet, a lot of, lot of characters. What made you pick this topic to write about? Because the, the, the title caught my eye. Good. So, you know, that was good. We want. Um, well, I grew up on St. Mark's Place, and my parents moved there in 1973, and they still live there. They're in a top floor walk-up. They do the stairs twice a day, and they're in better shape than I am. Of course. And uh, so, no, it's, it's my hometown, so I had to write about it. What else are you writing about these days? I'm writing a book about marriage right now because I had a story in the New York Times uh, a couple of months ago. It was called The Wedding Toast I'll Never Give. It was a modern love column about fighting with my husband, and so that's going to be my next book. The name of my latest book is The Cancer Survival Guide. And when I wrote it, I wanted to write a um, book that would kind of give people a way to jump start if they're diagnosed with cancer, because that's a horribly scary diagnosis. And it's so scary that I think it freezes most people. They can't think. But for various reasons, what you do at the very beginning, I've learned, can have a direct impact on whether you survive or not. So the moment you have to make decisions and think clearly and get knowledge and research is the exact moment that you're paralyzed with fear. Okay. So what I wanted to do is kind of step into the breach and use what I've learned over 20 years of medical writing and most you know, recently over um, four or five years with a lot of writing and talking to researchers about cancer and also what people are talking about more now, which is what to know when you're a cancer survivor because that opens up a whole other channel. Yeah. The term networking really began in the 60s when a radical by the name of Jerry Rubin used that term and branded it. And from that point on, people have been using it to meet each other. Now at the Miami Beach Convention Center, we have a small business expo where the whole purpose of the expo is for people to meet each other listen to what they do and see if what they do fits with what the other person does. This is Joseph Hoffman and we're at this great event and it's called Speed Networking where you can ask anybody a question about their business and see if there's a way to hook up with them. So tell me, how do you think we should hook up? Well, uh, I see that you guys work really well. Uh, you have a nice little show. I see this is your business. Um, I work in asset protection and helping clients grow, protect, and save their money. Um, so, like, we would meet up together, uh, we'd go over your different plan, and um, we'd see if there's uh, any good options for you. So, I have to have money before I could sit down and talk to you so that you could manage my money. You don't, you, you don't say, here, here, here's a starter. Go out there, here's a, here's a million dollars, go out there, make your fortune, and then I'll manage it for you. You don't do that, do you? No. Um, like my boss always said, we can't help the poor and we can't help the stupid. We have an anniversary coming up, and I bet you don't remember for what. I absolutely do remember for what. We're coming up on Memorial Day weekend, and we did our first episode of Alive on South Beach covering Memorial Day weekend five years ago. So congratulations. We're still in love, we're still married, <laughs> and we're still doing the show. And I, that in and of itself is an amazing feat. I'll say. I'm Dina Stewart. And I'm Stuart Stewart. And we're at the cafe at Books and Books on Lincoln Road. And we're alive on South Beach. For syndicatednews.net. Uh, hey there. Hi, I'm Bruce Weber, alive on South Beach.